Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. It's great to be back here at NYU. I, uh, this time last year, last fall, was a visiting professor at the law school. Uh, so I taught here for a semester, so these are some familiar environs, and my um, son is here, and he's actually here, here. Um, I made sure as I walked up here that he finished his evening class before he came here, um, and I'm, I'm told that, uh, that he did. Um, uh, so I was glad, obviously glad to hear that. What I'm going to do is just talk for about 10 minutes or so to, uh, to hopefully get the conversation going. And what I'd like to do with, uh, with my 10 minutes at, at the outset, and then as Trevor said, what we'll do is uh, Seth and I will have a conversation, and then hopefully all of us will have a conversation. What I'd like to do in the next 10 minutes or so is, is just briefly talk about what I see as three common misconceptions about Christians and Christianity. And one of the objection, uh, one of the objections, one of the objectives of, of what I'm about to say in the next 10 minutes is to weave together some things I talk about in, um, in the book that Trevor alluded to, a new book called True Paradox. And uh, also weave that together with the discussion of the campus access issue and the toleration issue that, um, that I think a number of us uh, are hoping to talk about. So the first misconception uh, that I'd like to, the misconception that I'd like to start with is a perception that religious belief in general and Christianity in particular is based simply on a leap of faith. Um, and that it's not based on, uh, has no evidential basis. In a fascinating recent book called Why Tolerate Religion, my friend Brian Leiter, uh, who's a very prominent legal philosopher, defines religion as having three characteristics. Uh, the first of the characteristics is that religion makes a comprehensive claim on the lives of a believer. And the idea there is if you believe a religion, it instructs you to do things that you might not otherwise do or, or not do things that, uh, that you might otherwise do. My view, so far so good with this definition. The third characteristic of religion in, in Brian's view and in his definition is that religion provides what he calls existential consolation. Um, now, I might use a slightly different term than existential consolation, um, but I think that's an accurate uh, part of a definition of what religion is as well. The part of his definition that I'd like to focus on for just a minute is the second part of his definition. And the second part of Brian's definition of religion is that religion is, quote, insulated from reason and evidence. Um, and the, his idea there is that religious believers believe things um, often despite evidence, and they continue to believe even if there is, is contrary um, evidence. This is a very widely held view of religious uh, belief. In my view, it's, it's mistaken um, and um, gives a, a misleading impression of what religion is and what uh, religion is about. Defining religious belief as irrational seems to suggest that those who are not religious, and I refer to them in, in my book, True Paradox, as materialists, people who, um, as, as many folks do, probably many people in this room, believe that the physical material world is all there is. There uh, is uh, everything is in the material world. There are no supernatural influences on the world. Um, so defining religious belief as irrational seems to suggest that materialists, folks who are not religious, reach their conclusions about the nature of our existence based on an assessment of evidence, whereas religious believers simply make a, religious, uh, make a, a leap of faith. In reality, in my view, each of us gathers the best evidence that we can find 
weighs that evidence and makes a conclusion about the way the universe works, about our understanding of the universe that is based on that evidence and is based on incomplete information. None of us has absolutely irrefutable um, evidence in favor of whatever it is that we believe. Religious believers and materialists are the same way in that respect. We gather evidence, we look at the evidence, we reach a conclusion based on less than complete um, information. Now obviously materialists and Christians weigh the evidence differently and weigh different evidence. Christians find the evidence of Jesus' resurrection compelling, for instance, whereas materialists do not. But both Christians and materialists weigh evidence and draw the best conclusions that they can. The second misconception is that the complexity of the contemporary world is an embarrassment for Christianity. Now, an atheist friend of mine, um, and this is uh, somebody I talk about in the book um, uh, a little bit, uh, in particular at the end of the book, an uh, atheist friend of mine wrote to me when he read a draft of True Paradox um, and said, and, and reflected this view of Christianity as, as not being able to handle or, or tell us anything interesting about the complexity of, our, of the world. This friend of mine said that Christianity is, quote, not much more than a human creation of Bronze Age peasants derived from wholly unexceptional and largely fictional narratives. Um, this is a friend of mine, um, and he's still a friend, and he's a great guy. Um, um, but he, and his perception is that Christianity just can't speak to the complexity of the modern world. Now it seems to me that his perception is, is actually exactly backwards. Um, and that Christianity provides surprisingly plausible explanations for, for many of the most puzzling aspects of how we experience the world. Why do we have consciousness, for instance, and the ability to, to discuss ideas about how the universe works? Consciousness is really, really difficult to explain from a, materi a purely materialist perspective, as many materialists will acknowledge. Someone like uh, Steven Pinker, very prominent materialist Harvard psychologist, says up front, we don't understand consciousness. We don't know why we have it from an evolutionary point of view, a purely uh, evolutionary point of view. Consciousness, um, our ability to make and debate ideas doesn't seem to have been necessary in any obvious way to the earliest human beings. Now, I should emphasize here, and this is something I emphasize in the book as well, I'm not making a claim that there will never be a good evolutionary explanation of, of consciousness. I think there will be better um, explanations. All I'm saying is our current explanations from a purely materialist point of view are, are not especially compelling and don't get us all the way to consciousness. From a Christian perspective, on the other hand, our capacity for rational thought, or Christians believe that our, our capacity for rational thought reflects the fact that we're made in the image of God, that God is rational, and that God created a rational universe that's a reflection of his glory. Now, my favorite bit of evidence that the Christian explanation of why we have rationality, why we have the capacity to talk about some of the kinds of things we'll be talking about tonight, and what I talk about in the book, uh, comes from a very famous article that was written about 1960, about 50 years ago. The article is called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences, in the Natural Sciences. It turns out, this ar article argues, that over and over throughout history, ideas that have been devised by math mathematicians simply to complete their formulas, completely abstract ideas, have turned out to have very real practical experience, have turned out to help us understand the way the universe works. And the, the best example of this, which I don't 
understand how it works, but I can tell you what the example is. The example is imaginary numbers. Um, the square root of, of negative one, I think, is an imaginary number. Completely abstract when it was devised a few hundred years ago, it turns out to be essential to the physics of subatomic particles. Um, from the perspective, a purely materialist perspective, that we're simply an accident, an evolutionary accident, this is really, really hard to explain. From a Christian perspective, on the other hand, it's not surprising, I would argue, that the, the universe is rationally intelligible and that our mind is somehow connected to the rationality of the universe. So this is one of the paradoxes or the puzzles I talk about a lot in the book that Christianity, I think, has some pretty good explanations for. Um, I also talk about the way we experience beauty and Christian explanations of that, how we experience suffering, um, and I also talk about our longing for justice and what Christianity can tell us um, about that. The third misconception, or what in my view is a misconception about Christians and Christianity, and the final one, is that Christians and Christianity are a threat to pluralism and diversity. Now this concern, in my view, as I understand it, lies at the heart of the current debate about all commerce policies and about uh, the, the debate known as, as campus access, which a few of you in this room know a lot about and probably some others don't know so much about. For those of you who have not followed the debates, it's a pretty recent debate, a number of universities have instituted what are known as all-comers policies. What an all-comers policy is, is a policy that requires any organization that is recognized by a university, and NYU has an all-comers policy, um, any organization to be recognized, student organization to be recognized, needs to make both its membership, if it has membership positions, and its leadership positions available to everyone. Um, so the no organization, uh, if you interpret uh, this the way some universities have interpreted it, no, no organization can limit its leadership to people who hold a particular set of views, consistent with the views um, of the organization. A few universities have recently de-recognized Christian organizations because these organizations, now this isn't true of all Christian organizations, but some Christian organizations require that their leaders be Christian. Um, and often they require that uh, leaders sign a statement saying that they have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, for instance. Most dramatically, the University of California has de-recognized a Christian organization called InterVarsity across the entire University of California system. Now the first thing to say about these policies, in my view, is that they are pretty clearly legal, even for a public university like the University of California. And for a private university like NYU, it's even more obvious that these policies are legal, at least now under current Supreme Court case law. In a case concerning the Christian Legal Society group, which is a group, a, a group at a number of law schools, um, this particular group was at Hastings Law School in San Francisco, um, a case called Martinez in 2010, the Supreme Court explicitly upheld an all-commerce policy. So the question for a university like NYU isn't whether such a policy is legal or not. It pretty clearly is, at least under current um, law. The question is whether the policy is a good idea um, or not. The second thing I'll say about these policies, and if you're wondering how many things I'm going to say, I'm going to say three, and then I'm going to sit down uh, if Seth doesn't grab me before, um, before I get to three. The second thing to say about these policies, and here I should emphasize, uh, if it's not obvious to you all uh, already, I'm speaking for myself. I'm not speaking for anybody else. I'm not speaking for Christian organizations. I'm just um, uh, calling it like I see it. Um, second thing to say is that I think my fellow Christians sometimes have a tendency to exaggerate the consequences of the application of, of an all-comers um, policy. Um, there tends to be uh, 
um, a perception that if an all-commerce policy is consistently enforced so that a Christian organization that thinks it's really important that its leaders espouse Christian um, belief in Christianity, there's a tendency to think um, sometimes that it would be the end of the world for the Christian um, organization. I don't think that's necessarily um, the case. Um, what would happen if you, you uh, acceded to this policy, if you're a Christian organization? Well, what, what would happen in theory is you could have an atheist leader of the Christian organization holding the Bible studies every week and doing the various things that the Christian organization does. If we believe that Christianity is true, and the we is Christians, and, and I believe Christianity is true, there's some upside to that. I'd love for atheists who wouldn't otherwise would be reading the Bible to start reading the Bible. They might be persuaded. Um, that's what happened to me. Uh, it could happen to you um, if, if you're in that position as well. So the second thing to say is, um, and I'm really speaking to fellow Christians primarily, it's not necessarily the end of the world um, and, and all commerce policy. The final thing that I will say is I do think the all-comers policies are a bad idea, um, and uh, I think they're a mistake. One of the things that, um, that is striking about the all-comers policy it, policies is they're almost never enforced across the board. They almost always have some exceptions. So they have exceptions for things like a, a, a cappella groups, sports teams, fraternities and sororities, um, which ought to give one pause, that the idea that a, a group cannot define who its leadership is um, is, is, uh, is a little bit odd. Another problem with all, the all-comers policy, or an all-comers policy in my view, is that it creates a temptation for organizations to be less than fully candid about what they're doing. It creates an, a, 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 a temptation for an organization to say, we have, we're, we're acting consistently with the all-comers policy, um, and to find other ways to make sure that their leaders are actually Republicans, if it's a Republican party, or Christians, if it's a Christian group, or, um, or whatever uh, the organization is. I'm not saying that groups would give in to this temptation, but it creates um, an unfortunate set of pressures, I think, on organizations. Finally, and, and most importantly, um, it seems to me, that all comers policies are inconsistent with the idea of promoting as much pluralism as we can. It seems to me that a much better approach is to have vigorous debate, debate of the sort that Trevor was talking about earlier, and that when you're ruling some organizations out of bounds, you're, you're reducing the amount of pluralism that you have on campus, um, and on campus is the one place where you would hope that as many groups as possible would be part of the conversation, including groups that, um, that any one of us might not agree with or think, uh, think uh, is uh, wrong-headed. So on balance, I think, uh, I think all comers policies are a mistake. I think they're legal. Um, I think uh, they're not as terrible as a lot of people think they are, but I do think that they have a tendency to chill pluralism in a way that's not healthy for a campus um, environment. So I'll stop there and, and hopefully we can pick up on some of these things uh, as we go through. Well, I wanna thank you, David, for that excellent presentation and I can speak uh, about the book itself, uh, True Paradox, and it's, it's really quite well done and I'm very impressed and it's a privilege to be here with you uh, on stage. Um, just by way of uh, full disclosure, David and I uh, hail from the same school. We both are affiliates of uh, University of Pennsylvania Law School. David is a professor there. And I, <laughs> I'm sorry about that, uh, but it must be told. Let the truth be told. I don't care who knows. Um, <laughs> I'm a graduate of that school. And uh, I've really been looking forward to our time together, David, and I really look forward to uh, engaging with you and having the, the group engage with you as well. And um, since uh, it's topical, and you were just speaking about the, um, uh, the uh, all-comers policy, why don't I pick up with you there, and then we can spread out to some of the, uh, the, the other issues we were talking about a moment ago. Um, as I've heard the argument, since I heard you uh, speaking about the issue just now, um, one of the things that comes to mind is that 
some Christian groups that are opposing this policy are actually a little bit out on a limb and alone in at least several universities and that there, there are many other religious groups, um, some Muslim, some Jewish, um, uh, some Hindu and others, that have embraced this policy, that have said, we, we, we're comfortable with it. In fact, I've heard of one group, a Hillel group at another university that actually have non-believers uh, on their board of governors. And so can't the point be made that if, it's, if other religious groups are comfortable with this, then what's the issue? Yeah, this is a, is a great question. And the way I would respond to that is to say different groups have, uh, have different perspectives and a different sense of what the essentials are. And I, I can't really speak to your specific example of Jewish groups and Muslim groups other than to say my impression is that um, within Islam, leadership and the identity of leadership is, um, is uh, I'm not sure exactly how, how to characterize this, but I'm tempted to say is, is less hierarchical and there's less of a sense of a leadership structure. Whereas within Christianity, although Christian denominations vary dramatically on this metric, there is a stronger sense within, um, within, uh, within a number of Christian organizations of the importance of leadership and having trained leaders and about what Christians would refer to as formation, teaching people what it means to, to live a Christian life or to think about things in a Christian way. And so um, to, to pull all this together, I think that there, there are different perspectives on what leadership ought to look like. Even within the Christian groups, there's some difference of, of perspectives. And my um, urging would be, uh, or my bottom line would be, I think it's really important to let a thousand uh, flowers bloom. The fact that not every organization considers it essential for the leader to hold the views of that, um, of that organization and to play a teacher sort of role doesn't mean that it's a good idea to exclude organizations that do think it's important that the leaders uh, hold the same, the values. And, and you can think of, um, uh, of lots of, of examples, or it's not hard to think of an example of, um, of, of why that might be important. This isn't exactly what, what um, what we're talking about now with, with the focus on leadership, but if you had a group that was um, a group that was oriented towards uh, survivors of sexual abuse, I mean, you might think it's really important that you have a certain type of person involved in that group and that it would really change the nature of the group if anybody could be part of, um, of, of that group. Well, then let me, let me press the question a little bit and see how you, 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 you take it. There are some religions that have, uh, that at least historically, refused to allow African Americans to be in leadership. Would you support their right to exclude African Americans? <laughs> so uh, Seth told me he was going to ask hard questions, um, and uh, uh, I don't think I would. I would say that um, that uh, I thought you were joking. I knew you were going to actually. That's a really hard question, um, and. Um, so I'll say a couple of things about that. One is that if you really were willing to follow pluralism all the way down, um, I think you would say that um, even a, an overtly discriminatory group ought to be allowed to be overtly discriminatory. And, and the um, Supreme Court case on this, which I'm sure Seth is uh, fully aware of, some of y'all are probably uh, fully aware of, was a, a case about, it was in the 80s, involving Bob Jones University that had uh, racial discrimination built into its, um, its founding documents. And the IRS, um, ended up taking away their charitable, saying that if, if you continue to discriminate on grounds of race, you're going to lose your, your, um, your charitable deduction, your tax deduction. If you, you take the pluralism all the way down, the answer would, would be we really ought to let even a completely discriminatory um, private group discriminate and uh, fight it out uh, in the war in the war of I or in the in the conversation in the battle of ideas and also through other things through affirmative action and through um, positive steps that the government could take um, 
I'm not sure that I'm willing to go quite that far. It seems to me in this country, racial discrimination uh, uh, against blacks in particular, um, that form of racial discrimination is different than anything else. Um, and it's wired into um, the Civil War Amendments, it's wired into the, um, into the 14th Amendment, and historically, particularly, or even at the time when the Bob Jones University case uh, was decided, which I think was 83 or thereabouts, um, there still were very serious segregation legacies. There still are um, in many respects, but, but even more back then. Um, so I guess what I would say is my instinct is to want to take pluralism all the way and to say, at least with a private group, um, we really want to err on the side of allowing everybody to make their, their own private rules. I do think race is the one exception um, to that, and I think it's an exception for historical reasons in this country. Um, you know, I think this country would look really different if it weren't for slavery. Oh, in the interest of time, what I might do is broaden the conversation. We can come back to the questions of the uh, all-comers policy in a little while. Um, but that does lead into a, a more general question about the, the whole nature of truth and what are we really talking about. We're at a secular university, a uh, strong belief in pluralism, in um, uh, not making a, 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 an absolute commitment to any one idea, but rather letting a hundred flowers bloom, as you, as you rightly said. So when we embrace this idea of truth at all, are we, is there a potential, as is often argued in intellectual circles, that we're, we're excluding necessarily, that we're imposing a power dynamic on, on, uh, on others? How do we navigate that, how do we avoid that danger on the one hand and still hold to a strong view of truth in a secular context? So I guess my starting point for answering that question would be to push back against the idea that some people think there's a standard of truth and other people don't think that there's uh, any truth. I believe that each of us has an understanding of truth. Each of us has an understanding of how the universe works. And that even an understanding that says every religion may have aspects of the truth, but no one of them is truth, uh, true. Every system of thought has aspects of the truth, but is not fully true. That's a, clue, a truth claim. Um, it's a claim about, the claim about the absence of truth in all other systems is itself a truth claim about the way the world works. And I think there is a, a tendency to assume that if we're challenging the truth claims of everyone else, we don't have truth claims um, of our own. And, and I don't think that's accurate. I think each one of us um, is carrying around a set of truth claims. And it may be that all religions are false, but, but that is itself a truth claim. And so if, if you accept that as a, a description of, of, uh, of the way we think, then I think uh, the approach is not to exclude points of view that have a strong vision of truth, but to, uh, to promote engagement of those views of truth, or what is sometimes referred to in the scholarly literature as um, to promote deep tolerance. So shallow tolerance is putting up with ideas that you think are wrong and maybe even offensive. Deep tolerance is trying to understand them, engaging them, and engaging them from the position of what you believe um, to be true. So I, I, don't, I really don't think any of us lacks a set of truth claims. I think our, our truth claims are just different. So maybe we can talk personally for a moment uh, on that very idea, David. You, you are a, a law professor at uh, a distinguished law school that's, that's not religious at all. Uh, and yet you are a committed believer. How have you navigated this tension between a commitment to uh, a vision, a high and deep division, a vision of truth as you understand it, and being part of an institution that's committed to tolerance and open inquiry? So I'll give uh, two different kinds of answers to, um, to that. So one answer is I feel very strongly different, different Professors may have different views on this, but I feel very strongly that in my classes at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, I should not in any way be privileging my Christian students as compared to my non-Christian students or one set of uh, students as, as opposed to another set of students. 
And so in my classes, I work very hard. I personally don't take, I, I don't make my faith an explicit part of my classes. When I'm talking about religion, I talk about it descriptively, um, or at least thus far, that's what I've done in my, my classes. So I think it's very, very important that um, our, the set of truth claims that, that we hold to, and for me it's Christianity, not exclude other perspectives. And so, um, so I feel very, very strongly about that, about um, I, I'm quite um, candid about my beliefs, um, but in the classroom, I don't make them central to the classroom, and I, I try really hard to treat all of my students um, the same. The other thing I would say, which in, in a way is pointing in a different direction, is one of the wonderful things about the emphasis on diversity that we've had in universities and law schools for the last 20 years or so is a lot of people, a lot of places take that diversity seriously. So at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, I'm the only evangelical Christian on our faculty but that's considered a good thing. I'm considered to be um, an intra, I mean, a lot of people think I'm a Martian. Um, you know, they think I, I, my set of my beliefs are, are completely wacky, um, but they think it's really interesting. And um, I am able to articulate them when I'm not in a classroom setting. I can give a talk like this in, in the halls and be quite candid about what my beliefs are. So two different things in a way, I think they fit together, but pointing in a different direction. One is, I think it's really important as a professor, no matter what strongly set, uh, held set of beliefs I may have, that my students not feel like it's essential that they, um, that they reflect those beliefs or they cater to those beliefs. I also think that one of the wonderful things about the emphasis on, on diversity in the past generation has been that I can be candid about what my beliefs are in the law school uh, halls and lots of other people who have different sets of beliefs can be candid as well. So you're respectful of not imposing your views from the lectern. Is there anything that you can do affirmatively or that somebody else could do affirmatively in a secular campus if one says, look, this is the most profound and deep and true thing that I know, and here we're in a, a place of ideas, what do I do with that? Um, so the couple answers to that question. One is you can give, you know, you can do an event like this. I mean, you can you can talk about it outside of the classroom. I also think that it's possible to construct a class that invites those sorts of, of perspectives. And I, I have not yet taught a class like this, um, but. Um, I guess it's up the road at Yale, at the Divinity School at Yale. There's a, a professor named Miroslav Volf um, who teaches a class at Yale that's called What is the Good Life? Um, and what the class is is a bunch of different classes with people articulating different perspectives of what it means to be human um, and what a good life should be. Um, sh uh, should look like. There could be a Christian perspective, there could be a Muslim perspective, there could be an atheist perspective. And in that context, it's, it seems to me that it would be appropriate for me or for anybody else to be quite um, explicit about what my views are, as long as there's an opportunity for other, uh, other kinds of views to be presented as well. I, I think that's a, a really interesting um, strategy for making it possible to, thought, to talk about the things that we care most about, the deepest part of ourselves, which often are not front and center in, in conversations in law schools or elsewhere in the university. Let me then share with you a conversation I had literally this afternoon with my dearest friend who has, has no particular beliefs in, 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 in God as such. And when I mentioned that I was going to be doing this event tonight, he said, well, you know, it's interesting. My wife and I were just talking about how um, all the conflicts in the world that we observe are religious and that those religions that seek to proselytize seem to be at the very heart of these conflicts. And he didn't feel that religion should therefore go away necessarily, but maybe it should go away. And what would you say to him? If, we, if our conversation tonight is about tolerance and truth, and these kind of words often seem to animate people to kill each other, what do we make of that? 
<laughs> uh, haven't you already used up your, your tough questions? <laughs> um, this is a great question, and it's an important question that I think is on a lot of people's minds, and not least right now with some of the things that are going on um, across the world. So uh, I'll say a couple of different things uh, about that. One is that many of these conflicts, in my view, are not really conflicts about religion that there are conflicts about other things. So that um, a, a Muslim friend of mine, I was talking to her about what's going on in the Middle East right now, and she said it's, it's not really about religion, it's about land, and it's about, um, and it's about power. So I think it's very important um, to distinguish religion as the cause on the one hand, and on the other hand, religion as being an instrument of, of other kinds of, of motives. So that's one thing that I would say. Another thing that I would say is that often these, um, these kinds of responses are, are aimed at Christianity and talk about uh, uh, some of Christianity's past, the Inquisition in the Middle Ages, um, the treatment of Galileo um, often comes up. Some of the stuff in the 20th century, um, anti-Semitism, there are some Christian connections to that. As a Christian, I think we have to admit that Christi Christianity has contributed to a lot of evil um, in, um, in the world and that we need to repent of that, um, that we, we need to acknowledge that. What I would say um, on top of that, and you could say the same thing about, um, about slavery in this country, the, the arguments for and against slavery, there were Christians on both sides of, of both arguments. The one thing I would say about Christianity in particular in response to that kind of, of a concern is I believe that Christianity is uniquely self I mean, there, ha there are abuses that have been committed um, through time, and, and people talk about, well, has Christianity been responsible for more good or more harm? How do you weigh that? I, I, I believe, if, well, I, I believe we, sh we shouldn't be weighing it in the end, but, um, but I believe that Christianity is, is self-correcting, so that when you look at these abuses, the Inquisition, you look at um, slavery, and you look at what Jesus said and did, invariably those bu abuses cannot be squared with what Jesus said and did. And Christianity is very different from a number of other um, systems of thought in this respect. So um, with something like Marxism, some of the Marxist abuses of the 20th century, there's a pretty good argument that they come out of Marxism. Um, that, um, that what Marxists did, they, they were distorting Marxism, but that some of the abuses were consistent with the ideas behind Marxism. And, and I think you can say that about some other religions and systems of thought. I don't think you can say that about Christianity. Um, I, your, the argument about self-correcting, uh, the self-correcting nature of Christianity really intrigued me in your book, and I, I would like to pick up on that further. Um, let me just highlight that my, uh, that my questions, I hope, are, 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 are an expression of my deep uh, respect and, and admiration for your excellent and work. And we are doing exactly what I'm claiming we should be doing, okay, uh, which, is, uh, which is pressing <laughs> beliefs and asking tough questions. I'm just, I'm just calling them tough questions to stall for time while I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a very good strategy. Um, as I think about self the self-correcting nature, nature of Christianity, I, I find myself bumping up against uh, Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. And it was one of the, the highest expressions of, uh, of the case for civil rights. And it was in response to a, uh, an advertisement that was placed in a local newspaper by uh, local clerics that were calling for him to stop boycotting and stop uh, protesting. And I wonder what we would make about the self-correcting nature of Christianity in light of the fact that he was having to deal with clerics. And he even says in that letter, one of his biggest disappointments is how little support he'd received from the white churches. Uh, absolutely, and uh, uh, probably everybody in, in this room has read Letter from a Birmingham Jail. If you have not, it's one of the great documents of American history. Um, I would put that and Lincoln's second inaugural would be in my book as the two greatest uh, writing slash speeches in American history. 
Um, so what I would say is, I mean, it's, it's sad. Uh, the, the letter is, um, is responding to Christian ministers who said, slow down. You need to be going slow. Things will change over time. You're pushing things um, too fast. What I would respond, I would respond in a couple ways. One is to say that, that Christians have made mistakes. Um, we can see historically, but more importantly, um, Martin Luther King Jr. was not responding with a non-Christian perspective saying, um, you know, your Christian perspective is all washed up. What he was saying was, you're not manifesting what Christianity teaches. If you look at that letter, it is full of biblical references. And, um, and Martin Luther King Jr. is a Christian talking to Christians and saying, you know, I understand where you're coming from. That's that. Um, the go slow policy might make sense in some contexts, but I don't think it's consistent with the gospel. Um, and so my bottom line would be that is a deeply Christian statement, and it reveals that Christians don't always agree, and they, draw, they reach different um, conclusions, and, and they make mistakes. But it is not an indictment against Christianity. I think it was a, an extremely powerful use of Christianity. Very, very good, David. And um, let's then change the focus a little bit to, um, uh, to the materialist uh, response to some of the problems we see in the world. Um, are you convinced by, when you hear materialists look at some of these uh, complexities that your book is about, uh, the paradox of uh, beauty, the paradox of, uh, of justice, the paradox of consciousness, where do you find them, beyond what we've discussed in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in your opening talks, where do you find them most surprising and, tr and, and, uh, and deficient? Um, so most surprising and deficient, one thing that comes to mind is I started out by talking about how there's a very widespread perception that complexity is an embarrassment for Christianity, that Christianity can't handle the, the complexity of, of the modern world. And one of the things that really struck me with the issues that I talk about, I talk about um, beauty and how we experience beauty as a sense of transcendence. Um, and the way we experience suffering, we don't experience suffering typically, suffering either of ourselves or of a loved one or even in the, in the natural world, we don't typically experience it as, oh, that's just part of the way the world works. We, we very frequently have a sense that, that it's reflecting something wrong, that it's somehow immoral or, or evil. One of the things that has really surprised me as I was thinking through the book is that the most sophisticated materialist um, thinkers very frequently give short shrift to these experiences. They treat our experience of beauty as irrelevant to what it means to be human. They, um, they suggest that we don't, in fact, experience um, suffering as, as uh, somehow immoral. And so the irony of that, to me, was that, that often on, on the kinds of issues I was talking about, which are some of the subjective, the puzzles of our subjective experience of the world, materialism often flattens out the complexity and treats those experiences as, as not important. Say one other thing, um, and that is, um, it, it's a little bit more nuanced, I think, and, and that is about human rights. Um, one thing that Christians sometimes say about uh, atheists and human rights is, well, Christianity gives a foundation for human rights. Each of us is made in the image of God, Christians believe, and so each of us has a dignity, um, which is, is the starting point of human rights. Christians will often say that atheists um, don't care about human rights or don't have a theory about human rights. I don't think that's true. I think um, I don't know anybody who doesn't care about human rights. And, and some of my atheist friends are doing more um, to, to try to advance human rights than anybody else I know. Where the difference is, is I think a, a Christian foundation for human rights looks a little different from an atheist foundation for human rights. The standard 
atheist or materialist foundation for human rights usually bases human rights in consciousness or something about um, our, our, our mental abilities. And often they'll talk about our ability to make plans for our life. What you're interfering with when you interfere with somebody's human rights is their ability to make plans for their life. This is Peter Singer, the Princeton ethicist, uh, makes these kinds of arguments. Um, that view of human rights tends to suggest that people who have normal or above normal um, capacities in this regard are superior to people who don't. So, so uh, Peter Singer will say explicitly that babies who are born with reduced mental capacities, it's appropriate um, to, to kill them um, under appropriate circumstances. A Christian view of human rights, on the other hand, says that we are all made in the image of God. We are all similarly made in the image of God, no matter what mental or physical capacities we do or don't have. So there are differences, I think, um, but I also think it's very important to acknowledge that, that something like human rights is a value that we hold very broadly. It's, it's, the Christians do not have a monopoly on that value. Um. So talk to me, if you would, please, about how if someone does have a Christian outlook and wants to bring it to bear intellectually, scholarly, even relationally uh, here on the campus, what would be some of the best ways to do that in a way that's consistent with the desire for tolerance and truth? How would you bring it to the classroom? How would you bring it to your conversation with, with your best friend? Uh, so another great question. It's not a hard, I won't call it a hard question. I'll switch to, this is a really great question. Um, it does not admit of an easy answer, as we say in, uh, as we say in law school. So a couple kinds of, of um, answers to that. One is that um, there is room to develop a Christian intellectual tradition. And, um, and to write about the kinds of issues that people are, are writing about in law schools. This is something that, um, that, that Catholics have tended to be stronger on than Protestants. I'm Protestant. Um, there is not the same kind of intellectual tradition within Protestantism, at least in the last 100 years or so, as there is in Catholicism. So one answer to that question is, um, is a scholarly answer in terms of what we write about and how we engage in the scholarly conversation. Uh, another is, um, is more, again, events of this sort. I mean, one of the things that my students, uh, at least at Penn, often find um, uh, a little disappointing is that in, in law school, at least, um, there are a couple related things. One is that we don't talk about justice more than we do. If you talk about, if you use the word justice in a first year law school class, you're likely to get slapped down um, and told that you, we shouldn't be talking about, um, about justice. Um, so it, it, um, it makes it hard to talk about some of these issues, makes it very difficult for people to talk from, um, from um, the tradition that is closest to their heart and to their own thinking. Uh, one benefit of these kinds of events is it provides a space for that, where you can talk about what does it mean to think about um, campus access from a Christian point of view or from a Muslim point of view or a materialist point of view. What does it mean to think about human rights? Um, so I, I, those would be my two initial answers, I think. And just a word of, uh, uh, just a program note, in just a few minutes we'll be turning it over to questions from the audience. So if you have ideas that you'd like to ask, just get, you might be wanting to think about those right now. Um, I'll just share something uh, and get your take on it briefly, if I may, David. Um, um, I majored in economics in, at the undergraduate level, and uh, years later I actually had the privilege of teaching it here at uh, NYU. And in between, I became a Christian. And to my surprise, when I revisited the ideas that I'd first encountered as an undergraduate, when I revisited them with my Christianity in place, I was surprised that that gave me a, a, a foundation to look at the faith assumptions at work in this seemingly scientific and um, uh, neutral um, subject. And I discovered, oh my gosh, there are tremendous numbers of faith assumptions and value assumptions at work here, and I'd never noticed that before. I just sort of assumed it was 
quote, scientific. And I wonder if you've encountered that in your work. Absolutely. And a, a classic example in the economics world, and this may be what you're alluding to, is the kinds of rationality assumptions that economics tends to make. Um, economics, contemporary economics, tends to be based on an assumption that we all act in our individual self-interest. That's what rationality is defined to mean. Material self-interest. Pardon? Material self-interest. In our material self, um, yeah, that's a good qualification. In our material self-interest, that is an assumption, and it has a philosophical sound a foundation to it, and it is a debatable uh, assumption. And, and one of the things that's come out of the recession of 2007 to 2009 is a rethinking of that assumption by, um, by many people. But um, once you start to think deeply about whatever your faith or non-faith uh, perspective is, I, I think it does naturally cause you to think about um, about what are the assumptions and the foundation of, foundations of whatever it is that you're working with or, or studying. So I, I've had a very similar, um, a similar experience, but in, even on the economic scale. The, the last question I want to share with you uh, tonight before I turn it over to the audience, David, is a personal one. I know that you have two friendships you, you describe in the book. Uh, one with a, a dear friend who is a Christian who passed away fairly recently, and another, as I think you alluded to in your talk, uh, is a friend you actually made through Veritas Forum who is not at all a believer, um, and I believe their names are Patrick Ar uh, Arsenault um, and uh, Bill Stuntz. Bill is the, was the, uh, the Christian, uh, and, P and Patrick is not. Um, I wonder if you could just describe those friendships and how what we're talking about tonight connects with them. So those, those two friendships are really the key, uh, the key shaping influences on the book in, in many respects. The first friendship was a friendship with a law professor, a Harvard criminal law scholar named Bill Stuntz, who was a dear friend of mine for many years, who had a number of, of health issues. Ultimately, the last three years of his life, he had, um, he had colon cancer. And when he first, uh, a few months after he got his cancer diagnosis, we, um, we started talking about writing a book like this one together. And Bill said, if my diagnosis is good and I have a few more years to live, I really want to do this. If my diagnosis is bad, um, I have another criminal justice project I have to finish and, and we won't be able to get to it. Um, unfortunately, the diagnosis was not good. And the last conversation I had, this came out of lots of conversations in lots of ways uh, with Bill. We wrote a number of, of law review articles together as well. The last conversation I had with Bill face to face before he died, two weeks before he died, he said um, uh, that the one thing he was sorry he would not be able to complete was, was this book or, or the predecessor to this book. So when Bill died, I felt like I was carrying this around and I didn't know when, but I, I knew um, that if God gave me time, I, I would write the book at, um, or some form of it at some point. So about a year after Bill died, um, I moderated a Veritas forum like this at Penn that involved a, uh, a guy, a Christian, a defender of Christianity named John Lennox. And uh, I did what Seth did. Um, and, uh, and Better. Yeah, they, no, not, not, not as well. Uh, I had some help. I, I, was, uh, giving, I was using questions that had been submitted um, by, by students. Uh, so I had a cheat sheet. Um, but after the Veritas Forum, I got an email from an atheist postdoc uh, at the medical school at Penn named uh, Patrick Arsenault. Um, and Patrick praised me for, um, for asking tough questions um, of John Lennox. And uh, I, I sent uh, Patrick an email saying, um, I really appreciate your email. I've been thinking about these issues. I'd love to get together for coffee. So we, we started getting together for coffee um, periodically in the spring of 2012 and talking about these kinds of issues, about beauty and about evil and Christianity and other religions. And he is absolutely an atheist. He hasn't budged that I can tell um, since then. 
But after we had a couple of these conversations, I, I thought I should just go ahead and start writing this book. And so I started writing it. And Patrick and I have been in conversation ever since. Um, in fact, we, we just got together for coffee a, a week or two ago, and um, we'll probably be debriefing about some of the, the tough questions that Seth is asking. Um, so uh, it's two very different shaping influences on the, on the book. Uh, yeah, they're very moving in your description in the book, David. Um, and um, just, a, just a word before I turn to the questions. The book is really excellent, and it was a real pleasure to read it. In fact, I'm rereading it, and uh, I strongly encourage everyone to read it, too. Um, now I have some questions from the audience, and the first one is, is what's at stake with the current conversation on tolerance campus access? Meaning, I, I think that's with reference to the uh, Kamal uh, 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 all commerce policy. What do you think is at stake here? So there are a lot of different, there are a lot of different ways to answer that question. And um, whoever asked the question should feel free to, to, to follow up as, um, as well. But I guess the way I would answer it is to say, what I think is at stake is our understanding of pluralism and what pluralism means and um, whether what boundaries we should draw around um, around pluralism, um, I I if any. I think that's really uh, really at stake, and um, I think. Um, there is a there is at times a little bit of a, a discomfort with robust pluralism for reasons that I think are, are quite understandable as, as I think I've made clear I think we should uh, that I think we should err on the side of pluralism even if um, if Christian groups or other groups hold views that that people strongly strongly um, disagree with, but I, I think that's what's at stake. I mean, and to, to put it more broadly, you might say what's at stake is our vision for what a university is. And I, I think there is a plausible vision that says um, a university ought to set boundaries and we ought not allow views that, that seem far enough outside of the, the, the mainstream. I, I think it's understandable that some people would have that view. I think that's a mistake. I think it makes much more sense to err on the side of, of, um, of pluralism. And if you look back over time, I think his history has borne that back, that typically the, the, the groups that get marginalized because the university is taking a position on, um, on who's in and who's out, tend to be vulnerable groups or small groups in one side, and it changes from generation to, to generation. It's different now than it was 20 years ago. Um, and I'll invite uh, whoever asked the question, if you'd like to follow up. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, it's like one of my classes. <laughs> that's what I got. It, it, it was that good an answer. Yeah, it, well, that's not what my classes say, but. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Stephen Hawking, in his book, The Grand Design, um, speaks uh, to a new paradigm in how we understand the universe. He talks about quantum mechanics as a potential theology, with quotes around the word theology. My question is, can there be a synthesis between concepts like quantum physics and evolutionary biology with Christianity? Thank you. <laughs> uh, your questions were easy, Seth. Um, um, it's an interesting question, and, and I should start out by saying that my knowledge of uh, quantum mechanics is pretty close to zero. Um, um, so I'll say a couple of things. That, that with the, um, the ideas that are being tossed around now, and I haven't seen the latest from Hawking, and I, I think there's a movie that's either just out or about to come out um, um, about Hawking. But with the ideas that have been, um, well, let me back up one step. So, um, so a hundred years ago, if you if you asked people the, how the universe worked, the conventional wisdom among um, folks who were scientifically um, sophisticated was that the universe has just always been here and that the Christian idea that God created the universe, there was a moment when the universe was created, was seen as, as wacky. And, and it's a famous debate involving Bertrand Russell when he says it 
just always was this way. Um, the evidence that we have now really strongly suggests there was a Big Bang and there was a beginning to the universe, which is very much consistent with the, the Christian vision of the way the universe came into to being. Now there are some very sophisticated, very es esoteric views on offer, such as the possibility that there is an infinite number of universes rather than just one universe. I'm not qualified to arbitrate among these theories. Even physicists have trouble arbitrating among them. But they don't strike me as, um, as for the most part, necessarily inconsistent with Christianity at all. The, the possibility, if, if, you, if, if we believe God created the universe, he could have created uh, an infinite number of universes. That's not necessarily inconsistent with Christianity. There is some effort among some physicists, and, and Hawking's view may fall into this category, to try to imagine a way a universe could emerge from nothing um, with um, with no prior matter, uh, Larry Krauss, a, a popular physicist, wrote a book called A Universe from Nothing. Um, the critique of that book has tended to say it's not really nothing that he's starting, um, that he's starting from. So I guess my general answer would be I don't think these understand that these understandings are necessarily inconsistent with Christianity and I do think that there's a temptation often for Christians and other uh, points of view have this temptation often as well, to um, be a little bit anxious when the way we think we understand the universe being created is destabilized by, by something that physics is finding. Um, as long as the new finding's not inconsistent with Christianity, I, I don't think there's a need to be anxious. And, and the kinds of things that physicists are talking about, for the most part, don't seem to me inherently inconsistent with Christianity. And because uh, the question also brings up this word evolution, I'm going to ask you to uh, pick up on that too, because I think if there's one word that just seems to be evidence that Christianity is stupid <laughs> on a campus like this one, it's some Christian's response to the evolutionary uh, uh, science. What would you say to a Christian and to a, someone who's considering Christianity on that subject? About evolution. Um, well, a footnote, well, uh, maybe I shouldn't go here. Um, um, uh, I'll just say this much. My, for my friend Patrick, my interlocutor, my materialist interlocutor, this is a big issue with, with, with him. And so my understanding, the way I think about evolution, and I, I would encourage other Christians to to think in something like these terms, even if they don't agree with me. Um, the way I think about um, evolution is um, that as a Christian, I believe that the Bible is absolutely authoritative. And I, I, I um, try to live by the Bible. Uh, it's sometimes hard to understand. Some things are easier to understand than other things. But when Brian Leiter says that uh, religion, a religion such as Christianity, um, has a, a hold on, it's a comprehensive view that has a hold on um, an individual's life. That's the way I feel about Christianity. I believe that the Bible is absolutely authoritative. I also believe that God doesn't play games with us and that um, what science seems to be telling us and what we have pretty good experimental and other kinds of evidence for, um, there should be a very strong presumption that that is in fact true, that, that God's not, you know, God didn't hide dinosaur bones in, in the world. And so I personally believe, not lots of Christians don't agree with me about this, but I personally believe that the scientific evidence for evolution is very compelling. Um, and so as a Christian, I believe that it's essential to, to hold these things together, the authority of scripture and what we learn from, um, um, from scientific evidence. Not overstating what we know, but um, what we have good, good evidence for. It, it, it's difficult to fully reconcile evolution with, with scripture as I understand. I think they can be reconciled. Um, um, I, for instance, I believe in a literal Adam and Eve. I, I believe that a God that could raise Jesus from the dead can create a literal Adam and Eve to, to act as representatives of, of, uh, of humanity. But I personally think that the evidence for evolution is too strong just to dismiss it um, um, out of hand. I mean, many Christians who um, have 
very similar views to me about the authority of scripture, um, think that, that scripture rules evolution out. I don't think that it does. And, and I, I think it is really important as a Christian to wrestle with those, uh, with those issues and be willing to not feel like you have it 100% um, figured out. And, and the final thing I would say about this is I think these are important issues. I think about them a lot. I read about them a lot. They're not the heart of my faith. The heart of my faith is Jesus died for my sins. He was resurrected from the dead. And because of that, I can be reconciled with God. Everything else is secondary. Okay, very good, David. Um, next question is, is this. Evangelism implies that a pluralistic society is undesirable from a biblical perspective. Is pluralism within Christianity prescribed um, denominations, and does that conflict, I'm sorry, is, is Christianity uh, preferred d uh, denominations, and does that conflict with the, does that conflict with the idea of one body in Christianity or absolute truth within Christian beliefs? Did you get that? I can redo um, it. I think so. Why don't, why don't I take a whack at Because okay. I see it as, um, as possibly two different kinds of questions, which are both very important questions. So um, one question I took to be, does, is Christianity a, um, a view that all other views need to be stamped out? That is Christianity a, a view that pluralism is a bad thing? Um, I don't think it is at all. I mean, I, I think uh, as a Christian, I wish that everybody would be persuaded that Christian, that Christianity is true. And I believe that I am called to try to um, make a case for Christianity and, and to evangelize, to, um, to uh, use the term that the, the um, question uses. But I don't see Christianity as inconsistent with pluralism at all. And I, I um, this is another thing on which my views, there, there may be a different, there is a difference of views among Christians as, as among a, a lot of perspectives. Um, my views are, are my own. Um, I think they're right, but, <laughs> but they're my own. Uh, I don't think that um, in a pluralistic country that our government should be trying to speak we, with a Christian voice. I don't think we should have prayers in the schools. I think that's not consistent with, with how I understand a Christian vision of, of, um, of, of secular government. So I don't feel at all that Christianity is inconsistent with pluralism. Pluralism is a fact of our, our lives. It was, a, it was a fact in many respects, even in the time when the, the Bible was written. The Bible recognizes pluralism. Um, so I, I don't see that as a problem for Christianity. What I took to be the other question here is, is a question about diversity within Christianity. So if Christianity is true, shouldn't there be um, just one version of Christianity? Aren't denominations inconsistent with Christianity being true? I, I think that's a good question. I don't think that differences uh, among Christians um, tell us anything about the, the truth of Christianity um, um, for a couple of reasons. One is that we're, we're just by our nature limited. We don't understand um, everything uh, or even or we don't understand everything that uh, Christianity teaches. It's also the case that many of the issues on which um, Christians diverge are not, in my view, the core of Christianity, that they are, they may be important, but they're secondary issues. So to, to give one historical, uh, maybe, well, it's not trivial, but small historical example, um, Christian churches differ on baptism. Um, should, should somebody be baptized when they're a baby, or should they not be baptized until they're adult, an adult and have embraced Christianity as, as an adult? Those, that issue is very important in some respects. It le has led to denominational divides, but I don't think that it is. it gets to the heart of Christianity. I think the heart of Christianity is about Jesus and the resurrection and who, who Jesus was. And from that perspective, there's something um, rather attractive about denominations. And this is me speaking as a Protestant, but um, different denominations are, in a sense, different kinds of performances of Christianity. Um, and I, I think the diversity is actually kind of exciting in, in some respects, rather than, um, that, rather than concerning. 
And one of the things that surprised me, as someone who has corporate law background, is that one of the big differences in denominations is just the way they organize themselves. Congregationalists, it's the parishioners who are most powerful, Episcopals, it's the bishops, uh, Presbyterians, it's the, uh, the board of directors, as it were. So often it's, it has little, is less to do with the theology than meets the eye. I would push back again. I would agree with you about your basic point. I would push back about the less to do with theology because the, the differences in governance structure, in my view, are based on different theological understandings of the way churches should be structured. So Fair I, enough. Uh, so I happen to go to a Presbyterian church and. Um, uh, we're responsible for the American system of government and everything else. Um, uh, you use the term board of directors, which is um, not a Presbyterian term, but it is a Presbyterian uh, uh, concept. The Presbyterian concept is a concept that um, the decision-making authority is a body of leaders, not one particular leader, whereas in other churches it'll be one particular um, leader. So, but there are, there are theological reasons for those differences. I don't believe those are essentials. I get that. Fair point. Um, one last question I'll read, and um, as I do, I invite you to ask people uh, to uh, fill out your response card. Um, and, uh, that'll, and we'll wrap it up uh, with the question. And then, I'll, David, just as, a, as, a, as, a, as an additional thing, I'll ask you to add to uh, your answer any other thing that you feel we should have covered tonight but that we didn't. Um, so here's the last question uh, from the audience. How much is uh, repentance over past harm by Christians governed by who wins and therefore who creates the narrative? With the LGBTI community, um, and the harm done, the future might be a story of repentance or a story of justification, depending on the outcome. So is Christianity self-corrective or just good at admitting when it loses? That's interesting. Um, and I'm not sure where to go with the admitting when it loses. Actually, can you read that again? So I, sure. um, um, the whole thing? If you don't mind. Okay, sure. Hopefully okay, sure. okay on time. That's sure. Just, it's a pretty subtle question. Yeah, it is. Uh, how much is repentance over past harm by Christians governed by who wins and therefore who creates the narrative? With the LGBTI community and the harm done, the future might be a story of repentance or a story of justification, depending on the outcome. So is Christianity self-corrective or just good at admitting when it loses? So this is a great, this is a, a, a great question. And I'm gonna focus on the, how much of a narrative, how much is the narrative based on who wins? And I might push that a little bit and, and push it towards um, not so much who wins, but what view prevails over time. I think it's a great point. And I, I think that with, um, with, Many of the most divisive issues, the, 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 the trickiest issues that we face, face, there has been a narrative over time. And so with, with slavery and race, there were serious debates about this 100 years ago. Um, now there is a narrative that's, that has, has won out, I think has rightly won out, which is that slavery is, is wrong. And I, I, when I think about this, I, I often think about the famous Martin Luther King Jr. statement that the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. And I'm, I'm not sure if it always bends towards justice, but I think it usually does. With the issue over things, with the debate over things like same-sex marriage, I, I, which I think is a big part of this question, I, I think it's, a, I think it's a, a really important question, and I think this is exactly the right, right way to look at it. So um, what I say when I'm involved in conversations about same-sex marriage is I say a couple of different things. One is um, I believe that the, the traditional view of marriage is intellectually defensible, um, that, um, that that's... Um, a view that, that not everybody would agree with, but I think there, there are arguments for it, just as there are arguments um, for same-sex um, marriage. I believe that in our culture, this is going to end up answering the question, I, th I think. I think that in our culture, as a matter of secular law and what the secular definition of marriage is, I think that that debate's over. I, I think that same-sex marriage has won. Um, it's just, a, it'll be a couple years, five years maybe, and, and there'll be same-sex marriage in 50 states. 
I think um, my fellow Christians who hold to a traditional view of marriage need to acknowledge that. Um, that is the reality of secular marriage. What Christians who hold to a secular view, or excuse me, to a traditional view of marriage ought to do and ought to be focusing on, in my view, is having the space within their congregations to live out their understanding of marriage. So to the extent that somebody were to suggest that a church or a synagogue or a, or, um, a Muslim house of worship um, must perform same-sex marriage, marriages even if, if they don't agree with same-sex marriage. I, I think that is perfectly appropriate to push back against that, and I think pluralism, um, as I understand it, ought to allow different um, religious organizations to live out their view of, of um, the proper understanding of marriage. And this is where I come back to, the, um, to this question. What I think will happen is over the next 10 or 15 or 20 years, we will see how this all plays out. And if same-sex marriage is clearly um, the appropriate vision of marriage, I think that'll be clear. Um, whereas if the um, traditional view of marriage is a compelling alternative, I think that will become clear. Um, so I, I really do think um, that there will be a historical um, test of the different views of marriage, and I think one view will likely prevail over time, and um, that's the way these issues play out, and I, I, I think um, that's the way we ought to look at it. I think we ought to provide a space um, at this point in time for different visions of marriage and, and see what happens. Um, and somebody will win or uh, a view will come to be seen as the normative view in 15 or 20 view years, I think, and, and I think it'll be obvious. Um, it, it's not quite clear which view that's gonna be yet. And just as a closing observation, David, I just want to note that um, the words we've been really emphasizing tonight, evidence, complexity, subtlety, are not ones that we usually associate with religion in general, Christianity in particular, but it's really been at the very heart of both your book and your presentation and our conversation tonight. And I just want to praise you and thank you for making that such a highlight, uh, such a, a key part of our conversation. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you, Seth. Um, and I, I mean, that really is the core of what this is all about, is, is um, complexity and the beauty of complexity. That it, complexity is not something we should be afraid of, it's something we should embrace. And you've really made the case for that, and I really appreciate it. Thank you Thanks so that. much. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.